Hello everyone and welcome to Teaching Physical Sciences. Today we're joined by Tabiso. Hello Tabiso. Hi. <laughs> and of course we have Dylan behind the computer controlling all of the switches for us. Now before we find out more about Tabiso, let's talk a little bit about how you can communicate with us. Uh, if you would like to send any questions, comments, anything like that, please use the hashtag VTScience on Twitter obviously. And Dylan will be watching that feed to see if there's anything useful to bring to the discussion over here. Okay, Tabiso, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, like I said, my name is Tabiso Ndaba. I work for the Department of Education in Gauteng, and I've been involved in education for 22 years now. I've spent some of my 15 years in school teaching and for the last um, about eight or so years, I've been in the office and currently I'm coordinating physical sciences in the province. Uh, just to explain it a little bit more, it means I uh, work with a team of district subject, uh, uh, district subject advisors and I supervise them in curriculum implementation and assessment. And of course, there's more other things that we look and uh, responsible for other than curriculum implementation. So you know your stuff then? Well, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you do. Yeah. <laughs> Shall we begin by yeah. looking at grade, what's happening in grade 10 at the moment? Okay, so grade 10, what have they come from and what are they doing at the moment? Well, the grade 10s, I think, um, from the beginning of the year, they did a little bit of uh, chemistry, math and material. And, um, and now, um, from the top of my head... Um, particles, what particles are made of? Is that... Know. I know last week we spoke to John, and he was talking about physical and chemical change within grade 10. Yeah. And so that is what's coming up in the future. Yeah. 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 Okay, uh, and you've also put together some links for us for any grade 10 teachers who might be struggling in this section. Okay. Um, I see that you've chosen to use everything science. Well, the, it's the online textbook, isn't it? So it's very easy to find, isn't it? Well, the links are, well, well it's not necessarily online textbook. Yes. But yes, there are tutorials, there are notes that you find on the links. Um, there's educator resources like simulations, uh, demonstrations, videos, video clips that you could probably download or view on these links. And they are very handy and they're helpful and uh, teachers can use them in the classrooms as okay. well. Okay. Oh, so grade 10 teachers, if you are struggling, there are some resources that you can look at. I will put them up on the blog later. Let's move on to grade 12. Okay, so grade 12, we spoke about this a bit on the phone earlier, about work, yeah. energy and power. And you said that um, they were, would be struggling a lot with uh, remind me here, what are they struggling with yeah. in this section? Well, the grade 12, uh, in the term one, of course, they were busy with momentum. They went on to do um, vertical projectile motion. And I think in this term, they busy with work, power and energy. They've, they've done um, organic chemistry in term one as well. Okay. So work, power and energy, it's a topic which is really not so complicated. Okay. But somehow the students are not doing very well in this topic, especially in the final exams. We've seen through the internal moderators' reports, which um, you know uh, indicated that learners are doing badly in this topic. And in my experience, as I thought, sat down with my team of district subject advisors to try and understand why learners are doing bad in this is because of a number of misconceptions okay. that learners come through. And some of these misconceptions largely are created by the language 
usage, especially when they define work for an example. Yes. You know, and um, the area which the learners struggle most is the uh, inclined planes. Okay. Okay. But if I can go back to um, just to illustrate, sometimes people define work as force times displacement. Okay. Okay. And th this definition of work creates misconceptions. Okay. Right. Sorry, Tabiso, I'm going to interrupt you no. there. Unfortunately, most people aren't able to read sideways. Can you just write it over okay. here? Okay, must I write it the other way? All yes, right. please. Thank um, you. Let's wipe it quickly. All right. Um, so work equals? Work equals to force times displacement. Okay. Okay. Most people prefer this definition. You will see that cap has m caps has moved away from this definition okay. because this definition it creates m m many misconceptions. Let me make an illustration of this. Say here is a box, all right? Yes. It's on ho a horizontal surface, and I have a rope and I apply a particular force on that okay. at a particular angle. Let's say thirty degrees. Yes. But as I pull the box, the box is not moving up, but is moving horizontal. Yes. So which force now is responsible to move the box in the direction of this arrow? It is not this force. Okay. And so when you use this definition, you likely that learners are going to use this force yes. in this formula. Yes. All right. But then if we change our definition into the definition that is used by the CAP document, which is W is equals to uh, the force, okay? Yes. I can put those change in S cos of theta. Okay. I hope the viewers can see that. Yes, I'm okay. sure they can. Now, if I put this definition in weights, I may not be able to write everything here. I would say work is a product okay. of the displacement and the component of the force okay. parallel to the movement of the object. Okay. Let me see if I put that. Now let's put it into perspective now what I'm saying. I was saying work is a product of the displacement yes. and the component. Once I start talking in component, I'm introducing an angle yes. as a force. Okay. Component of what? of the force okay let's put it in a diagram the same diagram yes. that i had here is a box horizontal i'm putting a force there okay let's say at an angle of 30 degrees that is the force yes all right so i'm saying in terms of my definition it is not this force which creates a movement but it's a component of this okay okay in this case it will be the horizontal component Okay, so if you go to your geometry, uh, your trigonometry, trigonometry ratio, yes. you will be able now to determine the component of this force. Yes. Okay, which is going to be F cos theta. Okay, it's going to be F cos theta. Okay? okay, but remember we said work is a product of the displacement and the component of that force, which is the horizontal component. This is where the change in X comes in. Okay, so then it doesn't create a misconception because you know there's a force here, there's a force there, then learners don't know which force you're talking about. Yes. You're talking about that force, you're talking about this force. If you say work is force times this, then you have to be specific which force. Yes. So language is very important. It is, obviously. Yeah. Thank you for that. Okay, so in inclined plane problems, then grade 12 shouldn't find a problem because, you know, that definition, if they apply it consistently and all the time and there are problems, then they should know which force we're talking about. Okay. Now, when is this concept of work introduced? Is this only introduced in grade 12, or is it carried it starts, through from previous from grade, grade? Grade, grade, grade to 10. So know, really our grade 10, 10 grade, yeah, teachers then, should be listening yeah, now But then in well. grade 10, they don't do the components or the yeah. implant plays and all that. Yeah. They focus more on what work is. Yeah, and maybe it's situations where work is done in situations where work is not done. Okay. Something like that, yeah. Okay. It's more theory that they learn in grade 10. And the and application? to grade 12. So, so there's a year gap between the two? Yeah, yeah. Sure. Okay. 
Thank you. And let's move on to our main section of the thing, grade 11. Yeah. Okay. So grade 11, we're talking today about geometric optics. Uh, why don't we talk first about why this is important? What is it about? Where can it be used in real life? Well, first for now, it is important because it is, an, it, it is examined. Okay? Learners are going to write the final exam. Uh, there will be questions on geometric optics. So short-term goal. For an example, in grade 11, there's about 32 marks, which is from the knowledge area, uh, wave, sound, and light. Of okay. which geometric optics is part of wave, sound, and light. So it's important that it is taught. It is important that um, you know um, learners study it because it will be there in an exam. Um, they are required, for an example, in their school-based assessment to do an experiment on, sna on, on Snell's law, uh, which marks will be used towards promotion. Okay. So for now, in their school, it's important. So short-term goals. Yeah. Okay. In assessment. future, learners might decide to venture into telecommunications. Okay. You know, and op uh, geometric optics applies there. For an example, today we speak of the internet, which high speed, which is a broadband, and it uses fiber optics. So fiber optics is technology based on uh, geometric optics. Okay. Yes. I'm wearing glasses. Yes. Know, a lens and so on. In medicine, you know, they also use geometric optics. Uh, it may not just for lenses only, you know. Um, sometimes we, uh, what is this, a sauna? Um, oh, for when you're having a baby. That's, no. 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 Uh, no, I'm not sure what you're talking about then. I know about babies. It's, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's move on then. Yeah. It's, not, yeah. not, not, you see, uh, all right, it's fine. Um, other than that, you know, in, in, in marine yes, life. Yes, marine uh, life, you know, yeah. Uh, submarines to navigate, they also use uh, light and things like that, which is also geometric tele telescopes. For an example, the satellite, you know. Okay. Um, this, uh, what is the astronauts, yeah? um, you know, when they launch the satellite how about for an example it, yeah it, it, it uses light which is geometric optics so there are a number of careers which learners um, you know uh, simple things like uh, manufacturing of mirrors for an example it's, it's all based on geometric optics now most of these careers that you're talking about sound like they're careers for people who are quite skilled in yeah. physics that have a natural inclination I mean medicine you don't go and study medicine if you're struggling yeah. and things like that. Uh, well, I suppose what you're talking about is not really medicine per se, it's more radiography, if I understand you correctly. Yeah. Uh, but all of those careers... So this kind of section could be aimed at... You could use it to yeah. inspire your more gifted students yeah. to go into these fields. Yeah, you know, on the roads, we often caught by the speed traps. They yes. use these cameras that they Nef use. I'm never caught it's by them. <laughs> to be honest, I've been in one of those situations, but yes. it's been a while ago. Oh, well yeah. done. You know, it, it uses lights, you know, okay. how quickly the lights is reflected, and then I don't know, the machine can, you know, measure uh, how fast you are. That's like, fascinating. Like I was saying, uh, in medicine, sometimes when they use light as well, you know, if they bounce the light and how fast the light is reflected, they can measure the distances yes. of whatever that they're trying to check inside the body, where the tumor is and so on. Yes. You know, yeah. Okay. Well, th it's got a lot of applications in the real world. Yeah, yeah. What kind of skills do learners need before they start this section? You see, it's, it's geometric optics itself, you know. So you could quick, quickly think geometric optics, which brings mathematics, geometry, you know, there's a lot of diagrams being drawn, and um, learners need mathematical skills. Will they be required to draw diagrams in this section? Yes, 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 yes. Okay. And um, sometimes they will be required to, to calculate, hence mathematical skills. And, we and more specifically, which mathematics skills? 
for example, if they are required to calculate magnification, if they are required to use the Snell's law and calculate uh, the angle of incidence or angle of refractions, whatever, and then um, in grade 11. Yes. Know, in, in, in other grades, like the, the lower grades, when they calculate the size of the image and all that, so that's, that's something else. Okay. And then they, they might be required to use the Hens principle to solve problems, which involves calculation. So math skills are very important. Okay. But at the same time, science skills are also required. Yes, you for know, of course. Skills, yes. You know, they, they, they also are required yeah, in science. Yes. You Do know, you when find I say process skills, just a broad, but uh, if we break process skills, you know, you, you must be able to handle apparatus. You must be able to observe. You must be able to tabulate your results. Uh, you know, draw a conclusion, etc., etc. There seems to be quite a uh, a focus on that within the CAPS document. This yeah. process of process skills. Yes. Yeah. Am I correct in saying that? Yeah. Of course, when learners are doing experiments, they are awarded marks based on the scientific skills, which are these process skills. Okay. Okay. So when they do an experiment, then the teacher would uh, award marks based on these skills how they draw conclusion, the observation of the okay. results, um, and so on, yeah. I suppose that com comes back to the language they use as well. It's, it's got to be correct language if language they're is very important writing down the... You know, it is true language that um, concepts are put into perspective and that correct understanding um, is received. But at the same time, it is true language again that misconceptions are created. Okay, so for educators, yes. it is very important to use appropriate language at all times, the science language at all times, because then it ensures that the picture that is in the mind of the teacher is the same picture that is received by the learners. If the learners received a skewed picture, yes. then misunderstanding is a resultant or misconception yes. is a resultant. Right? I've, I've just had an aha moment as you're talking about that. Yeah. Uh, the terminology that I used when I was young has different, well not terminology, the jargon or d whatever, has different meanings to what it does to the youth today. So if I were to use something in a classroom to try and explain it a little better, rather than using the scientific language, I could create an even bigger problem yeah, by correct. using that. Yeah, if I can make an example, I can't think of any example uh, from the top of my head, geometric optics, but from grade 12 topic that we just spoke about it, work, power, and energy. Yes. Um, in everyday life, work means working, using physical hands and painting walls and all that. Yes. But in physical science, Work means something else. It doesn't mean necessarily painting walls and doing that. It, yes, you, you know? see, if I were explaining it, I Power would say. Power again, you know, it, it, it means something else. Mm. You know, and there's many, many ways in physical science which really mean something else in the sense of science, but in everyday usage language, they mean something else. So then it confuses learners if we would use these words interchangeably in yes. everyday life and in science. So that is what, why it is important for teachers to be consistent yes. in applying the science language in the class because then the communication becomes uh, easy and the learners understand what yes. you want to say all the time. What is important is to make sure that at the end of each lesson, the picture that I had is the same picture that is transmitted to the minds of the learners. Yes. In that sense, it's the same understanding. I can't be picturing an apple and the learners are picturing bananas, then we not on the same page. Yes. This, this juncture, the, you know, at the end of the lesson, it was just a waste of the lesson. If yes. It goes like that. How would you be able to evaluate that, evaluate that at the end of the lesson, whether they have the same picture as you? Well, teaching is not just telling, all right? Teaching is, 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 is it's a skill, it involves uh, an approach, methods that you, you know uh, you, you apply at the end of the day. Let let me begin by saying, in the beginning of the lesson, just to try and it's important that each lesson should have an introduction. Yes. And the purpose of the introduction should be to assess how much knowledge learners know about the topic. 
because you know there's a word that uh, is used to say Elena is not a tabula rasa. In other words, Elena is not a blank slate. Yes. Learners come to class with some amount of knowledge, but that knowledge may not be an accurate knowledge. Yes. It might be full of misconception. So diagnostic assessment is very important that probably even if you don't ask them to write it down, but through question and answer, yeah. you're assessing the learner's knowledge and how much they know and how much misconceptions they have. So it's an informal so question and before answer. Before you teach, now you resolve those misconceptions, Yes. which you could explain, you could demonstrate, you could do an experiment. Um, it will help if you do an experiment, it will help if you demonstrate, or even if you bring a picture. You see, because bringing a picture means what you see is what the learners see. Yes. You can even illustrate by drawing pictures or diagrams on the board, just to make sure that you have the same picture with the learners. Then, when you start introducing the lesson, you are on the same page. You have the same understanding with your learners. Okay. At the end of the lesson, of course, to see whether the objectives of the lessons we have reached, you have to ask your learners questions. Okay. Obviously, you prepare questions in advance. Yes. You know, and the way the learners will respond to those questions, either in writing or verbally, exchanging question and answer, the way learners respond to those questions will tell the teacher whether the learners have understood or not. Yeah. Well, yeah. That if it's verbal, then it at least is immediate feedback for the teacher. Yeah. But having written answers could also aid with assessments and it's things very like that. For learners to write. Yeah. Because it also becomes an evidence yes. of the work that was done in the class, the teaching. And the learners can always fall back into their books yes. to revise and to study later on in preparation for the test of an exam. So it is important, you know, for yeah. them to write. Yeah. Okay. You have made a list of terminology uh, for us to go through. So yeah. we're going to look at it now. The first word is reflection. Uh, would you like to talk us through? Well, reflection in, in grade 11, probably they'll just have to revise, you know, reflection, which is turning back of light. You know, when you shine a light on a shiny surface, like a mirror, the light tends to be bounced back. Okay. If I can use the word bouncing back of light. So that is a reflection. Okay. Okay. If you shine light on a shiny object and the light bounces back, it is reflected. So that would be the definition you would that give? That would be reflection. Okay. Yeah. The next word is refraction. Refraction, any notes on that? How would you define that to a class? A refraction in simpler ways is the bending of light. Okay. okay. For an example, if you have a prism, all right? And supposedly, I draw a line like that, which is a, a normal line. In other words, if the light were to come straight like that, it would be the normal path of the light. Okay. But if I shine a light at an angle like that, yes. So the light is traveling from A, which is a less dense medium, into a glass prism, okay. which is a more dense prism. So what happens is, as the light enters a second medium, the speed of the light changes, it slows down. And what happens is an effect, the light tends to bend. So the bending bend. is a result of the light slowing down, the yeah. light wave slowing down? Yeah. Okay. Okay. It can bend. So okay. Refraction. Okay. Thank you. The next word is defraction. It, what is the difference between refraction and diffraction? Diffraction is um, when light passes through, for an example, a slit. Okay. Right? You would expect that the light should continue in that path, you know? Yes. If you create a slit, let's say my two fingers is a slit, but when you do an experiment, the, the opening, the gap is too big there, all right? Yes. So you would expect that when the light passes through here, it should be traveling straight on like that. Yes. If I were to have a screen, you would expect to see maybe the light hitting a screen as a dot. Yes. But the light doesn't do that. As it comes out of the slit, it spreads out. Okay. Okay. So the spreading of light, and then it casts a shadow on the 
on the screen, which would probably be uh, dark patches, light patches, and all that. So the light spreads out. That is diffraction. Okay. Spreading of light. Is that the kind of experiment that you would do in a classroom? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How difficult is it to get hold of the apparatus to do that? Well, schools can buy apparatus from the LTSM funds. Okay. But where it is not possible to do that because of whatever challenges, schools can improvise. For an example, if I take uh, two pencils, all right, and I put them closer, very close enough. That is forms, very close. It forms a slit. Yes. And then simply take rubber pens and hold them together, all right? And let's say now I put these two pens close and I shine a light here yes. with a normal cardboard with a white paper on it. Then you'll see those dark patches and light patches. It's, it's just a way that teachers could improvise when they have to show the learners. The and a normal light would be okay? A normal light bulb to yeah, do that? Yeah, a normal light bulb, yeah. Would a torch be or better? A candle, candle for an example. Really? Candle well, that's for an example. very doable. Yeah. Yes. But of course, you have to have your room dark in order to see that. Oh, okay. You know, put curtains or something okay. just to make the room dark. Yeah. Okay. Okay. The yeah. next. In lower grade, they show mm -hmm. diffraction. You see, here we're talking geometric optics, so it yes. has to be light. But in lower grades, they show diffractions by using water waves in a ripple tank where they put either, you know, a barrier and then the water um, tends to kill behind the barrier, which is also diffraction. Yes. So you, you don't need a ripple tank to do that. You can have a normal uh, tray. You know the tray where we serve tea? The, yes. You know, you could have a tray, put water in there, put a bit. Let's say, let me try and draw it. Let's say, <coughs> let's say this is a tray that we serve tea, all right? Okay. You know, it's it's lifts up so that the water doesn't yes. spill, all right? So you could put a barrier there, you could put a barrier there, and then um, you take whatever, and then as you hit the water like this, you know, as the water goes, it forms rings uh, out there, which is improvisation. So over here, the, um, whatever the waves the, would be straight. Yeah, you're just creating and a wave so that they pass through that. And then as a result, they would curve around yeah. over there. Okay, that you've touched on uh, another pre-knowledge that... So some of the apparatus, really, you don't need to those expensive ones. Yes. Yeah. It certainly makes the subject more interesting to do things like that in classes, yeah. to just talk about diffraction. Uh, if I was 16 and sitting in that class, I wouldn't know what my teacher was talking about. So that makes yeah. sense to you do see, those kinds of science things. Science is very pr practical. And sometimes learners, they have difficulty in picturing and visualizing things because it's not every learner who has an ability to think abstractly. Yes. So that is why the lessons should be differentiated. Okay. Differentiating a lesson means you need to apply different techniques, different methods to reach to every learner. All right. An experiment is one way which teachers could reach every learner because it is more concrete. Mm -hmm. It's something that every child learner in the class can see. And as you explain, they see what you're explaining. Unlike walking into the class and start talking to them and explaining, uh, and they're supposed to be picturing these things. And it's not every learner who's capable of picturing things. So either the teacher demonstrates, yes. or he affords the learners with an opportunity to do these things themselves. In other words, every learner brings a tray in the classroom and they put water and then they do diff diff you know, water waves. Yes. Or every learner brings a candle and then they put pens like this, they put a barrier, a, a screen, and they shine the light so that it shows those dark light yes. patches on the screen. Well, that, of course, just requires good planning from your teacher. You okay. know that yes, you need yes, to yes, do this yes, in a week's yes, time. Yes. Learners must yes, be notified yes. now. That's one of the very important things lesson preparation. Yes. Lesson preparation means as a teacher to sit down and say what resources do I need, even if it means a picture, even if it means I'm going to do an illustration on the board or I'm going to demonstrate its preparation. Science, it's very difficult if it will be taught by just talking. Yes. Okay. Shall we go on to the next word, which is critical angle? 
Tell us quickly about that. Um, the, the, the critical angle, you know, when they do the, the class prisms, you know, and then they shine a light, for example, that around class prism, and, you know, the angle which is formed there. And, you know, for each class prism, there's um, different kinds of angles. For example, earlier when we talk about uh, reflection, the angle which is formed by the light when it is reflected will be the angle of ref reflection. Okay. When we talk about refraction, it will be the angle of refraction. Or if it is that incident light, it will be the angle of inc incidence. So when you have a prism where you, you, you measure, it, you know, that would be also a critical angle. Okay. 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 It's, um, the next word is optical density. Optical, what is optical, optical density refers to the medium. Okay. Yeah, through which the light travels. I actually read it, at, so I did some research before doing this show yeah. because, as you know, I'm not gifted in science. I, I know a bit, but a little bit of knowledge is a dangerous thing. And uh, they were talking about the different optical densities of different mediums. They were talking about uh, glass and perspex and diamonds. And, and I noticed that the numbers got bigger with, as it got closer to the diamonds. Is the reason diamonds sparkle so much or because their optical density is higher than glass? Um, it, it depends on the arrangement of molecules, particles, atoms. Oh, okay. okay, so we're getting very complicated then. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. So a diamond, the particles, they are very, very close, packed, and dense. Okay. Okay. So uh, when you shine the light on, 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 on the density, you know, um, you know, it takes us to another theory now when we talk about, uh, you know, the photons, the energy of light. Yes. You know? So some material will give off light with more energy. Some material will instead absorb some of the energy. As a result, the light which is reflected or given out is not so luminous than, you know, the other material, not so bright okay. like the other one. Okay. So it depends on the material. Some, they retain that energy, absorb it. Some, they just easy to reflect and give that energy. So it, it, it would all of that knowledge be now. appropriate for grade 11 or where would no, you not stop? not grade 11. They don't do that in grade 11. Okay. They don't go as far as that, so. Okay. Where would you stop with your knowledge of optical density? It's, you know, like I said, it, it just refers to different types of material. Okay. And that is why in the textbooks they give them those numbers because they, you know, it's just the number that would be then they move on. Then they move on. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the next word is angle of incidence. And, well, we've got angle of refraction there. And you were talking about these with the critical angle as well. And um, I don't know if we really need to talk about those more. Yeah, I've explained that yes. if you have, for an example, um, let's say this is a mirror, okay, and I'm shining, obviously, obviously, what that line, which is a normal line. If you shine a line in an angle like that and it is reflected, okay, so you've got an angle here, which will be your angle of reflection, okay. but you've got your incident ray, which is going to be the angle of incidence there. Yes. All right. So it, it, it only refers to, you know, when it is reflected, the angle between your normal line and your reflected ray, it's the angle of reflection. Your incident ray and your normal line is the angle of incidence. Okay. Uh, now, to okay. be quite honest, if I, were t if I were looking at this, I would have expected the angle of incidence to be between the light and the mirror, not between the light and the normal line. Is that a, a common misconception, or is that just me? Maybe it's just you. No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Snell's Law. Yeah. Tell us about Snell's Law. <laughs> Snell's Law is just... Um, a law which seeks to explain the relationship between the angle of incident and the angle of refraction. Okay. You know, and um, you would then be required to do some calculations there to determine, you know, if you have your angle inc of, of incidence to be this, then what is your expected angle of refraction? So it's a calculation, yeah. Snell's law. Yeah, basically it's the calculation. Yeah. You see, if 
you were to design a telescope for an example all right and in that telescope you would want it to as 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 you make some adjustment and it it, it changes the images and all that all right which okay. is i think in caps they have to do that kind of a project um snell's law in in in, in the caps all that's right? interesting yeah how would I they when they do projects okay, okay. Um, I'm, I'm not but at the top of from my head but I'm not sure it's just that I remember when we're doing caps training one yes. of, of, of the projects as an example that we did was as 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 well so for you to calculate for an example the angle in which the light comes in to the telescope will determine how the light bends where the image will be and things like this so it is just basically a calculation that they, they they use it can be applied to big scale things then yeah okay and then the last point we have down there is and i'm going to try my best to pronounce this hugens principle is that correct yeah okay and what is hugens principle Hugen's pr you see we said snell's law looks at um, Ref the relationship between yeah, which is instance and ref refraction. Yes. But Heron's principle is to do with diffraction. You know, it's a calculation based on diffraction. Okay, and the diff diffraction was with the two pencils and the light shining through. Yeah. And the light spreading out, dark areas, light. Okay. So in grade 11, they go as far as that, you know, they, did, they don't go into much details. It's just the application of that formula. But in grade 12... In grade 12? Previously, you know, they, 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 they went into details. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, are they required to draw any diagrams in this? No, I've asked that question already, and you said yes. What kind of diagrams are they required in to draw? In grade 11 for now, I think it's, it's, it's the one that, you know, with the two pencils with a slit okay. and watch to draw those dark light patches and all that on the on the on the on the on the sc on the screen let's say if this is um, a slit and you know you shine an incident ray and they you know they will have your dark light patches and all that so that's the diagram that you know they'll be required to draw these dark light patches according to the caps so far in grade 11 this is your slit and this is the light shining through and the light spreads out and it shows you okay diffraction. would this be how the diagram looks on the piece of paper when they draw it or would they have to provide more detail than this yeah they'll have to provide more details in terms of which one are the light which one are the dark patches and so on okay would they label those light and dark patches yeah. okay Okay, you have put together a slide that shows us three pressure points where teachers have to pay special attention to yeah. these things. Um, terminology is very important. Yes. Okay. Because it is true terminology that learners get to understand what geometric optics is all about. Okay. Then your maths skills. Yes. You know, because they'll be doing calculations uh, also very. So your um, Snell's law and your. Um, skills, which in the Snell's law, they'll be doing calculations. Hegen's principles, they'll be doing calculations thing. All right. And uh, the third one, um, remind me. Third one, the ability to apply mathematical skills. Okay, I got that. Yes, uh, then the second one on the slide is the ability to state the relevant laws and oh, yeah, principles. Yeah. Okay, the Snell's law stating and the uh, Hegen's principle. Okay. Okay, so they need to be able to state the principles. Yeah, they should be able to state the Snell's law, they should be able to state the Hegen's principle. Of course, terminology, which is definitions, they should be able to, you know, um, understand what each weight means yes and then use of the math skills and process skills because they will be required to do experiments yes now what I like about the section pressure points is that um, if these pressure points 
aren't mastered or aren't paid attention to, the section will fall flat. And that definitely speaks true with math skills and the terminology and even the Snell's law. Even though that relies on the math skills and the terminology, yeah, it will fall flat. Yeah. 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 Um, okay, you've also put together a slide that shows five teaching, well, five point teaching strategy. Your first point says identify the pre knowledge and resolve misconceptions through the diagnostic assessment. Yeah. Okay, now you spoke about that earlier and you said that would be the introduction. Although here we're talking about the section as a whole. So how much time would you spend identifying your pre-knowledge? It, it, um, it depends on, on, on the lesson. Okay? Let's say the lesson is 30 minutes. I would prefer that for the first 10 minutes yes. of that 30 minutes, the teacher should be either allowing learners to write, give them questions to write, or it could be a type of a question and answer. So the question and answer is a quick one because we immediately can pick up from the answers, you know. Uh, but it, it has its challenges as well because mm. you might ask questions and then they all keep quiet. Yes. You see what I'm trying to say. But then you're trying to diagnose, you're trying to see how much knowledge they have and not just the knowledge that they have, but how much understanding they have. They might be having misconceptions, of course. Then we have to resolve those and explain. And as I said earlier on, the best way to resolve misconceptions is to illustrate, demonstrate, or to do an experiment. Okay. It doesn't help just to explain. Because Can you write those down quickly? Illustrate, demonstrate, or okay. experiment? Okay. If you illustrate, my handwriting. <laughs> I'm sure I can read it, and I'm upside down, so. Demonstrate uh, or experiment. Okay as a way of resolving misconceptions. Okay. I think, it, you know, it, it's the best way than just to explain. I'm not saying it's wrong to explain. Mm -hmm. You can explain if you can, but as I said, sometimes when you explain, the, the learner can still picture something in yes. the mind. But when you show it by illustration, demonstration, or an experiment, then you see the same thing that the learner sees. Yes. So it doesn't leave a room for a misconception. Yes. Now what happens if your experiment doesn't work? Well, teachers must prepare, you see. <laughs> you must do it beforehand so that it works in the class. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it has to work and you have to do that experiment before, you know. When you prepare the lesson, you have to decide to say, Am I going to do an experiment? Am I going to do a de demonstration? Am I going to less? Because you, you know how much time you have. In 30 mm -hmm. minutes, the experiment may not work because the time is too short. That's very true. You know? yes. So you might quickly illustrate by drawing a diagram on the board and talking to the diagram. Or you might do a demonstration, which you as a teacher now, you're doing the demonstration yes. right, or quicker than an experiment. Now the learners are involved here, so it takes longer. Yes, because yeah. they're well, they're new at doing yeah, this. Yeah. Your next point, point number two, says revise the relevant terminology, transverse longitude and transverse and longitudinal waves. It's a big word. Yeah. Reflection, refraction, etc. Yeah. I just mentioned a few of, of, of the terminology, but earlier on we spoke about that. So when I was saying revise terminology, okay, um, you know, like I said in the previous grade, the they study the, the waves, transverse waves, longitudinal wave, okay? So light is often explained as having a dual nature. Uh, it has a wave nature, it has a particle nature. Yes. But in geometric optics, we look at light as a wave. So it's important for learners to fall back and understand those uh, you know, terminology to say, when you say a wave, what do you talk about? Are you, are you saying now it's a transverse wave? It's a, uh, a long, they can picture that as well. And uh, we, we just spoke about reflection now, uh, which geometric optic has to do with the behavior of li light, okay? And how the light behaves visually. We draw diagrams to show that it is reflected, it is diffracted, it is refracted, things like that. You, you draw all those diagrams. So it's important to 
go back and fall back to some of the terminology so that you don't yes. leave your learners behind. You know, if let me make an example. Yes. If if it has never been explained to the learner the way to wave, and today I walk into the class and I start talking about waves, surely the learner will be, what are you talking about? Mm. Okay. If it's this kind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's important to uh, revise some of the terminology that learners might have learned before. And each time you introduce a term, then you explain that term as well, or give a definition of that term. Now, because it ensures that in your communication, you don't lose your learners. Yeah. Sometimes, uh, as teachers, we tend to communicate and talk and use terminology, but learners don't know what it mm. means. Okay. We forget that they're learning it yeah. for the first time. In my mind, it almost makes sense to build up uh, like a dictionary, a dictionary or a glossary of these terms in a separate book that they carry through from grade 10 to grade 12, yeah. where they write well, down those. People, it's up to the teachers how they feel they should do that, but um, some may not feel that it's necessary to build a glossary, because if learners understand the terminology, then they understand it. Okay. Okay, but if they feel that you need to build it, it's, it's, it's also acceptable. You know, but learners carry textbooks. I'm sure textbook they have terminology at the back as well. Yes. So it may not be necessary to build another one because textbooks have. But if you don't have textbooks, yes, your point is valid. Mm. Well, thank you. Uh, the third point says revise the geometric concepts with relevant examples, angle of incidence, angle of refraction, image formation, and size, etc. Yeah. Those are things that they don't do in grade 11. Those are things that they do in previous grade. But why I put that was just to illustrate the point that geometric optics, you know, optic is light. Geometric has to do with all the diagrams that you do, not necessarily the geomet geometry that, you know, the triangles and the squares in mathematics. But mm -hmm. geometric means shapes, diagram. So for reflection, as I've drawn earlier on, it will show a shape showing, you know, a, 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 a angle of incident being reflected. It is important to, to revise those things as well. So your first three points so far have been about revision and establishing where the learners are and building on that. So obviously you feel that these, this is really important. Yeah. Well, if we, if you, if you build the house, okay, in this case, the house is knowledge. You have to have foundation, isn't it? Mm. So revising the previous grade, you're laying a foundation. And when you build on that foundation, surely probably the house will be more stronger. Yes. You know, than if you start putting the roof. I'm sure it It's a good work. analogy, it makes sense. I'm sure it doesn't work like that. Yes. So in the classroom as well. If it's a teacher, I just walk in and I say, Now today guys we're gonna do a uh, snail's law and then I start giving them the slides law. Without any context, without you know, any background, so it, it would be... It, it becomes difficult, yeah. yeah. Some brilliant learners will catch it up, but some slow learners may not be able to catch it up. So you need to help them through and build up to the snails law. Yeah. Point number four, introduce and explain the snails law, like you've just said, yeah. and the Hugens principles. Well, basically what I was saying is once you have done your pre-knowledge, once mm -hmm. you have revised some terminology, if the lesson is on Snell's Law, at that point now you can introduce your Snell's Law because you have built a foundation for that. Yeah. If it is diffraction, then at that level then you can introduce your diffraction because you have built towards that. You know. What is important is that learners must form a picture, a whole picture, but not part of the picture. Because what happened is there's a tendency for the learners and it, it is a challenge that each time you teach a new subtopic within the same broader topic. To them, it's new information. They don't see relationship between yes. this one topic and the next topic. And it's because we never try and build up and link these things. Yeah. You know, and it, it creates a problem. Learners must see it as a whole. That is why this build up yeah. is very important. Okay, your last teaching point says assess the learners continuously and provide remediation. Yeah, what, what I like and what I advise teachers uh, most of the time is in any lesson, all right, I cannot stand in front and be talking beginning to the end. Mm. Then I lose the learners. 
like I said in the beginning, you do your diagnostic analysis uh, assessment by asking questions. Then you start teaching, explaining things. You stop, and then you ask questions again to see whether are they with you, are they, you know, and then you continue again. You teach, you stop at some time, you ask questions. So if I can illustrate it, I can say, you explain a concept for ten minutes if you can do that, and then you stop and allow learners to write uh, some questions based on the concept that you have taught. Okay. Right? So what happens is, I, I prefer learners to write. I know sometimes teachers, they ask quick questions. Mm. Quick questions are not involving all the learners. Only few that learners that will raise their hands. You know, usually those are the brilliant learners who are prone to yes. answer questions. They're eager to answer questions. I prefer that all, if, if, if you prepare a set of questions, either in a, in a paper or you write them on the board, then you're involving every learner in that lesson. Every learner is going to write. Whilst I said you explain 10 minutes, for the next 10 minutes they're answering these questions. Yes. As a teacher, you walk from learner to learner. You may not touch every child, every learner in the classroom. You might have gone to three of them, but that gives you an idea of what is it that I understand? Are they still having misconceptions? Where are the difficulties? When you return back to the board to explain again, usually we call corrections yes. because you're explaining the answers. It becomes another teaching opportunity again. Okay, you've taught them, mm -hmm. you've assessed them. Now you see they don't understand. When you go and explain again, it becomes another teaching opportunity. But this time around, you're explaining from a better understanding because you walked around the class and saw where the difficulties were, where the misconceptions, if yes. there were still any misconceptions. So you are at a better position now to explain from what you have seen. And then you teach some more further. Yes. If there's time for another 10 minutes, you stop again. You know? But of course, in between, just to break the monotone, you might want to throw a question in the air. Yeah. You know, and the answer. But I would prefer that most of the time you allow your learners to write. So most of the teachers prefer that you talk, 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 that at the end, then you assess them. It uh, sounds like a much more dynamic situation, yeah, what you're yeah. talking about. Talk 10 minutes, then they... When you think about it, uh, the, what they're watching, the content they're watching, is really only happening in 10-minute slots yeah. because of ad breaks and things like that. So it plays into their concentration yeah. span yeah, yeah, to exactly, do that. Exactly. Some learners can concentrate longer. Some can't. Those learners who are gifted, of course they can. But if you do that, you're losing those that don't have a long yes. you know, concentration span. So that's what I meant earlier on by differentiating the lesson to try and meet every child's needs in the class. Yes. Okay, now these five teaching principles, they're, they're very good and solid. How would you apply them to science as a whole? Science as a whole? Yes. Like I said, I've, I've put assessment at the end, but it doesn't mean that you only assess at the end. That is why I said in the beginning, you've got to diagnose, diagnostic and assessment. Mm -hmm. In the between your lesson, you stop in breaks and assess the learners. At the end, as a ma means of concluding your lesson, to assess whether the learners, you've met the objectives of the lessons or the goals of the lessons, you have to assess them. So I said, assess them continuously. Yes assess them continuously. I think that's time. a valid point. Yeah. We can assess them in the class, we can assess them by giving them homework. The one thing I like about assessing the learners in the class, you have learners who come from families where there's no probably space to study yes. or there are other challenges. By allowing the learners to write in the class, you're providing those learners with an opportunity to do work in the class. And also then they've got you there if they need to ask a yeah. question as yeah. well. Yeah. yeah. Now, you did supply us with three links, uh, and I thought they were quite useful. The first one was a link to the FET simulations, which John spoke about last week. Yeah. And it was, it's a different simulation that John showed, uh, where it shows how geometric optics works, I suppose, with a picture of a candle and moving it up and down. And you can change it to a light. I played yeah. with it a bit. Simulations so. are very beautiful because they depict kind of a real experiment, if I can put it that way. 
Yes. But it may not be, you know, a real experiment because you, you don't have a glass picker, but, you know, it's either you're showing it on the uh, screen, you yes. know, as it happens, and you can manipulate it the way you would like to manipulate it, and it gives you more or less nearly the same results as if you were doing the exactly the same experiment. Yes. So learners are able to see the results which are convincing, you know, and the FED simulation is actually uh, downloadable, free of charge. Yes, it's wonderful. For the teachers who are privileged, who have computers, they can download it into their computers and they can use this in the classrooms as a way of um, um, making it easier for the learners to see. Um, it definitely takes a lot shorter time than setting up an experiment and then demonstrating it. So if you are strapped for time yeah. and you have the technology available, you would be able to do yeah. that. But still I must mention this, this that uh, experiment is an ideal. Yes, it is. Because learners must be equipped with uh, scientific, which I call them the process skills yes. at the end of the day. So it is important that teachers, you know, in the busy schedule, they must make time for the learners to do experiment. Mm. But yes, on any other day, you know, when you need to explain and illustrate a concept, then simulations becomes handy. Yes. Mm. Now the other two links that you supplied are, uh, they're, uh, okay, so it's they're both websites that have a whole lot of topics yeah, on them, yeah. which is fantastic. I've clicked through both of them, and they they don't only have refraction and reflection and all of those geometric optics there. They've got other physics concepts that are there, so teachers can click through those and find quite a few resources there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's not just based on uh, geometric optics only; other topics as well. Uh, they from these links teachers can print out worksheets uh, they can print out tutorials meaning notes if you want to hand notes to learners yes in cases where they don't have textbooks you know I will always encourage teachers to allow learners to use textbooks yes as opposed to the notes because a note is but part of the whole if mm -hmm. you understand what I'm trying to say a notes can be 50 percent knowledge of the textbook yes but if the learners study from the textbook they're studying from the hundred percent I'm just trying you yes know, to, to paint a picture here but where you don't have textbooks what can else can you do mm. then you go to these links and you download all right mindset uh, uh, um, you know has a lot of videos yeah they're great uh, videos a lot of um, uh, tutorials mm. video tutorials which uh, can be used in some cases to revise the lessons and you play uh, geometric optics video all over again for the learners at least to hear maybe from a different voice. Mm. Maybe, yes. you know, if, if they, they hear better voice, uh, reinforcing my voice, two voices explaining the same concept, maybe yes. it, it makes sense to the learners. I don't know. So these links are very uh, helpful. Well, you teachers can be aware and make use of them. You've led on nicely into our next section, which is actually where we look at mindset resources. Let's take a look. Okay, we have a list of resources which are Learn Extra Live lessons. Now these lessons have been recorded in studio with live participation from learners who are at home. And the way they participate is through Facebook and through Twitter. They'll send in questions, they'll interact with the teachers. So often you have that element happening in the show, but that doesn't mean, because the show is now recorded, that the knowledge is not useful. It's still useful. They cover exam-type questions, and because they've got the learner interaction, they're often able to cover common misconceptions in those as well. And like you said earlier, it can just reinforce the knowledge that yeah, the correct. teacher has that's said correct. in yeah. the class. That's correct. It is a, a resource, as, as we say, uh, which can assist, you know, to enhance the quality of the lesson in the class. Um, I must admit that as a teacher myself, I'm sure in a normal lesson, there are things which I can explain very beautifully. Yes. There are things which may not come very well, yes. you know. So if I use another resource, it reinforces mm. the areas which I may not have explained beautiful so but then it helps the learners to get even more information 
and more clarity and more understanding. I think you've touched on a very valid point there that all of us have our strengths and weaknesses and even within the subjects that we teach yeah. we have those strengths and weaknesses as well. That I could be brilliant at teaching this but not so great at teaching that and I need to be aware that I'm not so great at that so I can provide extra resources to the learners with that. Yeah. Okay, we are coming to the end, so that means we've got time for one last thing. And our one last thing is taken from the book, Teach Like a Champion. And we are focusing on the actionable step, right is right. Now with this step, uh, this man, Doug, says that you should set and defend a high standard of correctness in your classroom. And what he's saying is that when a question is answered in class, a verbal question is answered, you should only accept the whole correct answer. So uh, if you're asking someone a question and they only provide half the answer, you should get the rest of the half of the answer from someone else. So you'll say, uh, that's You've almost got it. You're, you're halfway there. This, Sam, do you know what the other part is? What is Johnny missing from this answer? So it encourages the learners to always give the full answer and always look out for that full answer. Uh, I think, in my honest opinion, I think you should acknowledge someone as getting almost there because they, they have got almost yeah. there. If I can quickly comment, there's a danger yes. in it, all right? Yes. And um, personally, I agree with what you uh, just read and quoted today, that you must accept only the right answers. Yes. Let me make an analogy, all right? If we teach our learners, you know, we're not just teaching knowledge, but mm -hmm. we're teaching values and norms as well. Yes. All right? And if our learners come out of our schools with the attitude of exactness, with an attitude of correct and accuracy. Yes. Now think, do you have to stop by the bridge each time you drive on it to read on the names? If the learners who were building this, now they qualified, who were building this bridge were accurate enough or were estimating before you drive over? Yes. You don't want that. Yes. You want to drive with a clear mind over the bridge without worrying if the bridge is skewed, yes. is, is it going to fall? Let me make another example. If you happen to be in the hospital and admitted, mm -hmm. because the attitude is when you close uh, to accuracy is acceptable, and the doctor prescribes an injection of five millimeters, and he says five millimeters, and here is this nurse measures three comma something, which is close enough. All right, or not even three gives you four comma five, which is more. Yes. All right, it's fatal because that's an overdose. So you don't want that because people will die in hospitals. It has to be accurate. Okay. There's no room for an error. If a heart surgeon does an operation, there's no room for a close or it has to be. So in schools as well, yes. it's not about just the answers, which are more close. It's about the end product, the kind of a child who will be in the society tomorrow. Mm. So you want the learners in science to be accurate and to value that. Yeah, especially in, in a subject like science. Yeah. yeah. But also it, 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 it teaches our learners, you know, when they study to strive towards better understanding. Yes. than just to skim it through because they know that if I write something close I'll get a mark so you don't want that as well you've made it I didn't think of it from the studying point of view they, yeah. if they're aiming to get a hundred percent for that particular question they're going to know all of the the yeah. answers that you yeah. so it's, it's all it's all point. it's all about attitudes mm. the, way, the way you know if 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 you would give them a half a mark there you, you know to them it says I can be a mediocre is acceptable mm. and and I don't think we want that in our society you know you want people who are excelling. Yes. And to get the best and people who are excelling, you have to train them. Mm -hmm. 
and you can train them by only accepting what is right. And then tomorrow they will strive for only what is right. Well, you inspired me. Thank you. Good. And with that, it is time to say goodbye. Thank you very much, Tabiso, for joining us. Thank, Thank you, you Dylan, much. for behind the scenes magic. And please join us again next week where we'll be looking at grade 12 content. Goodbye.